while myself and the various Bible teachers here at Duluth Bible Church have taught around 40 books of the Bible over our 30 or so years of existence as a church, in fact, some of these books we've taught more than once, it's interesting to note that we've never taught verse by verse through the little book of Philemon. So today we're going to begin a study, a brand to study a brand new book of the New Testament for us. Though little in size, it is huge in application for all of our lives. For the book of Philemon is about how God's grace can transform our relationships. And here in lesson one, we will observe an amazing trophy of God's grace. And when grace transformed a family. And I assure you that it can transform yours as well, if you let it. And in this first study, we're going to concentrate on the first three verses of this little Pauline epistle. So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Philemon, snuggled right between 2 Timothy, excuse me, Titus, and the book of Hebrews. Philemon chapter 1, as there's only one chapter in Philemon. Though every believer in Christ is forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, they are far from perfect, would you not agree? And while from the moment they trust in Christ as personal Savior, their destiny is forever changed, from a hell they deserve to a heaven they don't. Their justification before God is not the same as their practical sanctification in daily living. In other words, being born again enters you into the forever family of God once for all, but does not absolute guarantee that you will walk in fellowship with the Lord day by day. Nor does spiritual birth guarantee, for sure, ongoing spiritual growth in every believer's life, though it does provide the resources and foundation for it, as God wants all believers to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And to do so, we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, and we've been given all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And though all believers have yet many faults and flaws, God is seeking to mature us into the image of his Son. And this is in spite of the reality that we're living in a fallen world and we're still packing a sin nature. And so believers still have problems, though we know personally the ultimate problem solver, the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the problems among believers is relational breakdowns. Relational breakdowns. Where does this show itself? Well, it shows itself in our marriages, which should be dramatically different from the world's marriages, but too often they are not. It shows itself in our families, which should be dramatically different from the world's, but too often they are not. It shows itself in our local churches, which should be assemblies where grace is not only taught, but practiced as well, but too often it is not. It shows itself in our neighborhoods, where we should be bright testimonies for Jesus Christ but our, by our lives and by our lips, but too often it is not. It should show itself on our jobs. Where our attitudes and our work ethics should be dramatically different from the unsaved as we do our work heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, but too often it is not. Now sometimes we experience relational breakdowns due to our stand for Jesus Christ and biblical principle. Perhaps you have been rejected by your unsaved family who thinks you have lost your mind and joined a cult because you now speak to them about your faith 
in Jesus Christ. You share with them the gospel, and you now want to study the Bible, and they think you are really weird. Perhaps you've been criticized by your unbelieving friends because you no longer indulge your flesh like they do and party with them like you did in your past when you used to live for your own fleshly desires. Or perhaps you've been blind by your unsafe family and friends and even your carnal ones because you won't bow the knee to political correctness and validate homosexuality as being an acceptable alternative lifestyle instead of a sin. And all of this results in relational breakdowns that God understands, in fact, he anticipates. And Jesus Christ even spoke directly about. For our Lord in Matthew 10, 34 through 36 stated this, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. In other words, may the Lord Jesus Christ be first in all our lives, in all of our relationships, regardless of what our families think toward us. This is also why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. This is why the Apostle Peter writes, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries in regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. And as a result, what do they do? They're speaking evil of you. So what happened to you from the unsaved due to your stand for Jesus Christ is not new to you. Nor is it new to today, but it's been repeatedly the case over the centuries for godly believers. But having said that, we must also openly confess regarding relational breakdowns in our marriages, our families, our local church, our neighborhoods, or on the jobs, that sometimes they are due to our own sins because of our own carnality, because of our own pride, because of our own selfishness, because of our own lack of agape love, because of our own unforgiveness. And I believe this is a real problem among believers. People don't want to admit it. Psychiatrists misdiagnose it. Doctors misprescribe it. Some folks rationalize it. Others excuse it. But if we're going to pin the tail on the right donkey... We need to take a good look in the mirror and start with the beam in our own eye by confessing our own sins of pride or selfishness or lack of agape love or bitterness or unforgiveness as the root cause of some of these relational breakdowns. Can you face this? Or are you blind to your faults because the other person's faults loom so big in your eyes you can't see your own? Is it always someone else's fault? Is it the weathers? Is it PMS? Is it because of? You always have an excuse. And you're starting to grow as a believer when you start to take ownership of your own decisions. That you take responsibility for where you may have failed in a relationship instead of blaming the other person, though there may be legitimate blame to be given. And because of these various elements that factor into our relational breakdowns, I am so thankful 
for Jesus Christ and his gift of salvation. I am so thankful for the word of God, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I'm so grateful for books like Philemon and its message to my own heart. For in Philemon, we'll see both the reality and means of how God, by his grace, can transform our relationships. In fact, what will we learn about in this little book, dear friends? Just listen to me. We'll learn from Philemon about God's love and grace to us because of Jesus Christ. And by the way, that is the starting point and the key to it all. Do you need this? We're going to learn about how God can transform a destiny, a life, a family, and other relationships by His grace. And that's usually the order. We're going to learn about the need and the means for relational reconciliation and practical forgiveness, which is so needed in our marriages and our families and our local church. We're going to learn about slavery and how Christianity addressed the social issues of the first century as this was the societal and social context of the day. And we're going to learn about how sound biblical doctrine finds practical application and expression in our lives. For remember, the word of God was not given to you by God and designed to merely scintillate your your intellect or satisfy your curiosity, but to transform your destiny and your life by God's amazing grace due to your relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is true of the book of Philemon. And so as we get started today, let's just read through the book of Philemon to familiarize ourselves with its content. Verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, and to the beloved Abphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, Yet for love's sake, I'd rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I've begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you but now is profitable to you and to me. I'm sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but much more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, 
My fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now this morning we want to get our feet wet in a a grasp of the context and the key people and some of the key principles involved in this little book as they are set forth in Paul's greeting in verses 1 through 3. So note with me the key people involved in this epistle. First one that is mentioned here is is Paul. Then we have Christ Jesus. We have Timothy. We have Philemon. We have Apphia. We have Archippus. We have the church, which is made up of people. We have God, our Father. And we have the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Those are the key people of the book, with the exception of one more, a runaway slave who became a believer named Onesimus, who this book revolves around in many ways, but isn't mentioned by name or even brought up until verse 10. Now with these people in mind, let's go on and learn something about who they are. And let's learn some key facts about this little book and some foundational principles that can transform our relationships. In verse 1, and in keeping with the wisdom and style of that day, we see the personal greetings. Beginning with the writer of this epistle, who was the Apostle Paul. Verse 1 says, Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. You know, there's something to be said about starting a letter with the writer's name. You know, in yesteryear, you didn't put your name until the end of the letter. Now, with email, you know in advance usually who just wrote you. You might even decide whether you're going to click on it or not, to read it or not, or just send it away to the trash. In those days, they began their letters with the writer's name, Paul. Now, what do we know about Paul? Well, his other name was Saul. That's what he went by before he was saved. The word Saul means well spoken of or great one. Where Paul means small. (laughs) And as he grew in grace, he got smaller and smaller in his own eyes. Isn't it incredible how God can take a somebody in the world's eyes and save them as a nobody to then use them as a somebody for Jesus Christ? And he does it by the grace of God. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.10, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. See, Paul calls himself in 1 Timothy 1.15 the chief of sinners whom God graciously saved. He had been an unsaved Pharisee. He was self-righteous to the core. And while he thought he was working his way, as it were, to the kingdom, he was actually working his way to hell. Because you can't go to, you can't have eternal life or be saved by your works. And thus Paul was the great persecutor of Christians who came to know Christ on the Damascus Road, Acts 9, and became the great defender of Christianity. He was the great apostle to the Gentiles. Apostles like Onesimus, this runaway slave who somehow comes in contact with Paul while in Rome and ends up getting saved. And God used this Paul to be a great dispenser of church truth and identification truth. Not the only one, but certainly a significant one as he wrote 13 books of the New Testament. So how did Paul view him? So how did he introduce himself in this letter? And what can we learn from this? Notice he viewed himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. You don't hardly ever find the mention of Paul's name without also finding the mention of the name of Jesus Christ or a mention of the grace of God close by. And may we never forget this as well. He calls himself here a prisoner. 
You see, for two years, he had been under house arrest in Rome. Now, we know from Acts 28 that he had his own lodging there. He wasn't in a prison, as it were, but he was in his own lodging. In fact, from Acts 28, we know from verse 30, then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. So he was allowed to have a rented house, which obviously saved Rome some money. But it gave Paul also some opportunities and freedoms, though he was still chained and still had a Roman guard there. But he was under house arrest awaiting trial. And it was during this time he met Onesimus. It was during this time he wrote this letter we call Philemon, written approximately 62 A.D. Philemon is one of four prison epistles Paul wrote at this time. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And do you realize that even in imprisonment, is a Romans 8, 28, as God works all things together for good. Even in imprisonment, is a Genesis 50, 20, even if they meant it for evil, God means it for good in the life of the believer. It was a way to evangelize the Romans' guards. It was a way in which he wrote books of the New Testament. It was a way to continue to minister to people. It was a way in which God used it to refine Paul's faith. And while Paul was in prison, it's amazing as he was still focused on Christ, thinking of and praying for and ministering to others. And I don't know what situation or circumstances you're going through today, but I know this, when you factor them into the sovereign plan of God and see them through the lens of Jesus Christ, you need not grovel and you need not grumble, as Paul didn't hear, but you can actually walk by faith and rest in him. In fact, Paul is glorying in this imprisonment, for as he wrote in Philippians 1.29, it's been given on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. And you know, as Philemon would hear these words or read these words, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and brought back immediately warm, affectionate memories and probably moved his emotional sentiments. My dear friend Paul, the one who led me to Christ. Yes, he's in prison. Yes, we've been praying for him. He wrote me a letter. Oh, yes, and he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, how is this introduction different than his usual descriptions and why? It's interesting because it's not Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, as he did not need to establish his authority to address doctrinal or church-wide problems like in Romans or 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, and so forth. In fact, seven times Paul begins an epistle with the mention of his apostleship. No, in Romans and Ephesians, there were no, no real practical problems. So why did he bring in his apostleship because they were great doctrinal books. And people would be asking, well, why should we read or listen to these? Well, they were written by an apostle of our Lord. That's why. And in First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, and Colossians, they were written primarily to correct doctrinal or practical problems. Why would he bring in his apostleship? Because people would be asking, by what authority do you have to tell us what to do? Well, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. But in the book of Philemon, instead of underscoring his apostleship, we read Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, as he's addressing a personal matter from one friend to another. And you know, at times, a spiritual leader needs to publicly teach and correct with biblical authority regarding both doctrine or practice. In fact, that's what the expository method of preaching does. You read the text, you explain the text, you apply the text. Also, at times, a spiritual leader needs to handle personal matters with a different touch and a different tone and in a different way. And as a pastor, I've had to do both. 
And I am careful where I have spiritual authority and where I do not. And pray for much wisdom, what needs to be handled publicly and what's just best handled privately. So the aged apostle from a rented quarters, which was his prison cell, is the human author of this little letter, though the Holy Spirit is the one who ultimately inspired it. So what do we know about this little book of Philemon? Well, we know that this small epistle consists of 25 verses in our English Bibles and 334 words in the Nestle's Greek text. It's the shortest epistle Paul ever wrote, at least that is part of the canon of the New Testament. We know, secondly, it was probably delivered by Tychicus when he brought the epistle to the Colossians. Now, why do I think that? Because notice what Colossians 4, verses 7 through 9 says. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. And I'm sending him with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. And so Tychicus and Onesimus had been with and visited Paul in his imprisonment and were now being sent by Paul to probably deliver his letters or epistles of Colossians and Philemon to the church at Colossae and to update them on the status of Paul in prison. A third thing we notice about this book is that of Paul's epistles, this is the only one written to an individual that was not a pastor. An individual that was not a pastor. Nine of Paul's epistles were written to local churches. Three of Paul's epistles were written to pastors. Two to Timothy, one to Titus. Only one is written to an individual who was not a pastor, though we will see he was a vital part of the local church at Colossae. Fourthly, of Paul's various letters, this is the only one devoted to addressing a private matter. That is, unlike Romans, which deals with justification, sanctification, glorification, dispensations, and many practical applications. Or First and Second Corinthians, that deals with the widespread carnality of those believers. Or Galatians, which deals with the truth that the law cannot justify the sinner nor sanctify the saint. Or Ephesians, which deals with the worthy walk of believers on earth as part of the church of Jesus Christ, who is seated in the heavenlies in him. Instead, the letter to Philemon deals with a private matter. A private matter between Paul and Philemon. A private matter addressing the return of Onesimus to his rightful earthly master. Furthermore, this little epistle addresses the problem of forgiveness and reconciliation regarding a runaway slave named Onesimus and his master Philemon. It's about forgiveness. It's about reconciliation. Now you might be thinking, this is great! If I only knew a slave that it applied to. But what about discussing forgiveness and reconciliation regarding those who have been practical slaves to drugs and alcohol? Or practical slaves by holding grudges and bitterness for years. Or practical slaves where of pride, as they want so much to be right, they can't admit they are wrong. Or practical slaves to legalistic performance-based acceptance instead of agape, unconditional love. You see, this epistle is about forgiveness and reconciliation. And it applies to you and it applies to me. And you need not be a slave for it to apply. But keep in mind when we study Philemon that this epistle assumes that Philemon was already established in sound doctrinal truths and now needed to apply them to this particular situation. In fact, remember, these two men brought two books with them, Colossians and Philemon. Both would be read in the assembly 
And Philemon applies to a particular situation the very truths that Colossians teaches. So Paul, in a sense, says, here's the doctrine, and I'll give you an illustration, an application of it as well, that will really hit home with you. Lastly, let me say that in this letter, we see the truth of God's grace and the gospel expressed not in a principle and not in a parable, but in a personal relationship, a relationship between Paul and Philemon. And personally, I love and find it very helpful when we can go in our studies beyond the abstract spiritual principles of the Bible to observe the concrete, practical illustrations of these truths by observing a life. Like we have when we studied Joseph, or like we studied recently the life of Asa, or which we will do here in the life of Philemon. But in doing so, let me underscore for you a principle I think we can draw from the text in light of knowing how Paul thought as he communicated in various scriptures. And the principle is simply this. God can begin to transform your relationships when you come to personally know and trust in Jesus Christ and then view your life and circumstances in light of your relationship or identity in him. Remember, it begins with Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, first on the list. Not a prisoner of Rome, like they thought. Not a prisoner because of the system. Not a prisoner because they got a bad rap, which most inmates say. But a prisoner of Jesus Christ Because in the sovereign plan of God, in light of my relationship with Jesus Christ, God put me here, as it were, for a particular task. You see, Paul knew Jesus Christ. Paul understood Romans 8.28. In fact, he wrote it under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And he knew that all of life was now to be viewed in light of his relationship or identity with Christ. We know in Adam all die, even so Christ shall all be made alive. And we all began in Adam. But by virtue of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and putting our faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, as it were, the moment we put our faith in him alone, The Spirit of God transferred us from being in Adam to now being related to, identified with, placed into union with Jesus Christ. As a result, before we were saved, we were unforgiven. Now we're forgiven. We were lost. Now we're saved. We were on our way to hell. Now we're on our way to heaven. We may have been immoral, moral, or religious, but still on the broad road that leads to hell. Now through the new birth, we're a child of God. We were working our way to hell as it were, and now we're going to heaven by God's grace alone. What made the difference? What made the difference was, again, Jesus Christ. Your past history in Adam ended at the cross and Your past will plague you until you acknowledge that you are now clear of Adam and safely hidden in the risen Lord Jesus Christ as a new creation in him. In fact, someone has written, and I quote, one of the penalties of self-occupation is self-pity and corroding remorse. You see, Paul no longer viewed himself in light of being in Adam. But he viewed himself in light of his relationship to Jesus Christ, and you need to do this as well. And he now viewed his circumstances in light of God's sovereignty, his divine appointments. And by the way, this is the only way to live life. God never designed your life and your relationships to be lived apart from knowing Jesus Christ. And thus we expect the unsaved to live like the unsaved, Because they are the unsaved. And the unsaved 
When it comes to their problems, simply rearrange the furniture in the room when God says, I'm going to offer to you in Christ a brand new house and a whole new set of furniture as well. But it starts by knowing Jesus Christ. Now, having viewed the key people in this passage, I want you to notice the other words in this passage and the relationship to them. We've looked at Paul, prisoner. Now notice, here's the key words. Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, and to the beloved Aphia, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're going to really see in this passage what God wants us to see, we've got to move beyond just the key people, which we will keep explaining, to the Pauline description, the model that he gives to us of how he viewed people and why that had a transforming effect upon his own very relationships. And I say it all starts right here. With Christ Jesus. We know that Psalm 127 once says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they what? Labor in vain that build it. Next in this introduction, we observe the associate of Paul in prison, who was his dear companion, Timothy. Verse 1 Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. Now, Timothy, we know, was saved through the ministry of Paul during his second missionary journey. And notice, what is he called here? He's called our brother. Literally, in the Greek, from the same womb. It emphasizes one position in Christ in a relationship to other believers in Christ as part of the family of God. And what great preparation for future pastoral ministry for Timothy to ride alongside, as it were, of Paul, and even see him respond to certain circumstances and difficulties and and have him write these letters and so forth. In fact, I really encourage you, younger believers, learn from older believers who have walked with the Lord when all possible. But notice we move here from Christ Jesus to now viewing others in light of that very lens, as brothers or sisters in Christ. And that's the second principle I'd like to underscore here, is that God can begin to transform your relationships when you view others in light of their relationship or their identity in Christ or the family of God. See, Paul viewed Timothy as a brother in Christ. Now remember, the body of Christ, which we're uniquely part of in this dispensation, is part of the bigger family of God. But it's still part of that family. And as you think of Paul and Timothy, their commonality was not their age. Timothy was much younger than Paul. Their commonality was not their ethnicity. Paul was a Jew. Timothy had a mother who was a Jew and a dad who was a Gentile. Their commonality was not their hometown. Paul was from Tarsus. Timothy was from Derby. Their commonality was their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and their relationship and identity in Him. They were both part of the family of God, not through some infant baptismal rite, not by joining some religion, but through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And through that gospel, they became part of the true church of Jesus Christ. They were brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ are described as such. And I'd like to just suggest to you for a moment that you stop and you look at your husband or you look at your wife, if they are saved, as a brother or a sister in Christ. And not just your husband or your wife. To view others in your age group as brothers and sisters in Christ. To view people with spiritual lenses on. 
And I say that because Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. We look at people differently than before we were saved. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, positional truth, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It can transform your relationships when you not only focus on Christ, but you begin to view others in light of their relationship to Jesus Christ. This is what Paul did to Timothy. But he also did it, and beyond that, to the recipient of this letter, who was Philemon. Verse 1 says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon. And it's interesting for his name, Philemon, comes from the Greek word phileo, which is one of the Greek words for love. Speaking of brotherly love, relational love, friendship love. Not agape and not eros, but phileo. Now, what do we know about Philemon? Just listen and gain a simple composite of him. We know he was a believer in Christ, was one to Christ through the ministry of Paul. We see that in verses 7, 19, and 20. He's called a brother, who actually owed Paul his own soul. He was a growing believer who was learning to walk by faith in the Lord and love others. We will see that in verse 5. And by the way, both are needed. He was a married and family man. He had a wife and at least a son. We'll see that in verse 2. He was very involved in his local church, which we also see in verse 2. He was a wealthy homeowner who had servants or slaves and used his house for Christ. And by the way, he's not condemned for having either. And I will explain a biblical perspective on slavery later in this series. He had learned foundational sound doctrine and it, and was now learning to consistently and daily apply it. And that's where we break down many times, isn't it? Some of you have been here for years, you know the doctrine, but it's that daily application of it where we break down, and I include myself as well. We also know he was a personal friend of the Apostle Paul, whom Paul planned to visit in the future. In fact, he says, set aside that guest room for me, I'm coming to see you. He apparently had been in his house, or he knew him well enough that he felt free to just basically invite himself over. Do you have friends like that? I did that a lot as a new believer. Probably insensitively so many times. But here in verse 1, how is Philemon described? He's described as our beloved friend and fellow laborer. You see that word beloved friend? That word beloved is the Greek word Agapatos, which we get the word agape, which is the word for love. The kind of love that is willing to do what is best for another in light of eternity, no matter what it costs you. And it's especially used of God's love. And thoughts on agape love are going to echo throughout this epistle. And he was also, secondly, a fellow laborer. Soon ergos. Soon means together with ergos, work or labor. It's where we get the word synergy from. And you see, in getting out the gospel, you are a fellow laborer. So he was not merely saved, he became a beloved friend, which means they enjoyed fellowship together and they labored together. For the furtherance of the gospel. It is so good when you have godly friends. Treasure them. In fact, my pastor used to say as a new believer, hear the word of God and get around believers who are enjoying Jesus Christ. That will help you grow. On the other hand, 1 Corinthians 15.33 tells us, bad company corrupts good morals. But keep in mind at times when it comes to friends that Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes they're the only people that are going to tell you you have B.O. and bad breath. 
And by the way, to have a friend, you must show yourself friendly. And I am absolutely convinced, based upon the word of God, that as you are saved and you're enjoying fellowship around the Lord, you can have a deeper friendship and a deeper fellowship because of the gospel and because of the word of God than anything else in this world. In fact, I remember when Dr. J.B. Hickson was here a few years ago, one of his first trips, we were over at Kurt Witzig's house, a bunch of the pastors and various men, and we were fellowshipping, and J.B. says, wow, I had no idea that you've known each other and a fellowship with each other and encourage one another for 25 years or more. And I said, yeah, we still like each other, at least for the most part. What this verse does remind me of, though, is God's lubricating grace. And I say that because, you know, the number one reason why people leave the mission field is not because of the difficulty of the circumstances. It's because they can't get along with their fellow laborers. And by the way, to do that, you need to be a team player. You can't be Joe Independent. Because now you have to work in an interdependent relationship, in dependence upon the Lord. And independent people don't know how to do that or don't want to do it or always think, well, of course I'll do it as long as everyone agrees with me, which becomes problematic. They say, well, how did this happen? And when did this begin? And how did Philemon know Paul? Well, most likely it happened in Acts 19, 8 through 10 where from Ephesus, Paul stayed, and at the school of Tyrannius, he trained various believers so that over the course of two years, all of Asia Minor heard the word of God. For you see, right here is Ephesus. Right here is Colossae. But through Ephesus was affected all these other churches, Smyrna and Sardis and Pergamos and Philadelphia and Hierapolis and Colossae and Laodicea and so forth. Philadelphia. See, Paul didn't go to all those cities. No, he understood what he would later tell Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, that the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, the same and trust to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. But Paul, again, did that ministry through the local church, sent out by the church of Antioch, as it were, on those missionary journeys. And Philemon came into contact with Paul and his evangelistic ministry there during this time. Which leads us to a third principle. That God can transform your relationships when they are centered around Jesus Christ and your desire to serve him. When they are centered around Jesus Christ and your desire to serve him. You see, again, Jesus Christ is the key to this. Viewing others in light of their relationship to Christ is critical. And now they were fellowshipping around Christ. They became good friends, and they were willing to labor together for the cause of the gospel. And you want to see a relationship transform, those ingredients will do amazing things to your relationship. Now keep in mind, just getting together with other believers isn't going to necessarily do that. Paul said to the, about the Corinthians that when they came together, they came together not for the better, but for the worse. And sometimes you can get together with another believer instead of being encouraged and built up. You're just torn down, you're discouraged, you're misfocused. And carnal believers have an amazing way of finding each other. And there's a lot of truth to the saying, birds of a feather do tend to flock together. You see, you can agape love all believers, but it doesn't mean that you can and will have close, intimate fellowship with all believers. Some of it has to do with proximity, but it has to do, more importantly, with doctrine, direction, and desire in your lives. You want to see a relationship transformed? Start with Jesus Christ. Start with viewing the other person in light of their relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And then begin to fellowship around Jesus Christ and serving him together. And in doing so, you can even begin to think of positive things. Like he, verse 1 says, our beloved friend and our fellow laborer. Now, do you think that Paul knew some negatives about Philemon? Of course. The more closer you get to someone, the more you see their flaws. And yet he chose to emphasize the positives. Not that there's never a place to say a negative. But so often our words tear down instead of build up others in our relationships. And we can choose to view people a certain way. Not that I, again, think that we just have to have some Norman Vincent Peale positive kind of thinking. But I do believe that grace allows us to view people a certain way. And grace even causes us to think God can change that person. Just like God has changed us. And God is still changing us in the sanctification process. And instead of just going in negatively, God can use this to encourage the positive. Are you just a negative kind of person? He always sees the worst in people. And I don't think we should be blind to people. We shouldn't be blind to the reality they have sin natures. Shouldn't be blind to what they're doing. Even a child is known by his doings. But how we choose to view them, and more importantly, how we choose to relate to and respond to them, has a whole lot more to do about us than it has to do about them. And this, these are the kind of things that transform relationships. But it all starts with Jesus Christ, knowing him, and then walking with him, and serving him, and allowing the word of God to shape your thinking about how you view and respond and relate to others. You say, can this affect a family? Absolutely. And we will see that next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your wonderful, wonderful word and for this introduction to Philemon and all the practical illustrations and applications that can flow out of this in our own lives. And I pray, Father, that we would just stop and pause and realize that too many relational breakdowns may be due to us. Yes, we know some are because of Christ. Yes, some are due to our stand on the word of God. We understand that, accept that. In fact, we rejoice that we can be counted worthy of suffering for Christ when that's the case. But on the other hand, Father, we must admit that, as Paul said, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice because it can be the case in our lives. And be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as you, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. May we not lose sight of the ditch from which we've been dug, the pit from which we've been delivered, the hell that we deserve, the grace that's been shown, what a difference Jesus Christ has made for us through his finished work and the hearing and believing of the gospel. And may we learn to view others in light of that and fellowship with other believers around our Lord Jesus Christ and even labor together with other believers for the cause of Jesus Christ. For we know that Satan loves to divide and conquer. And we know that you hate when believers sow discord among the brethren. And so, Father, may we start with pinning the tail on ourselves and allowing you to sift us, show us, change us. May we be willing to admit if we've been wrong and allow you to make those adjustments in our thinking that you want. And may this overflow in our relationships with others. 
And Father, we know we're still breathing air. You still have a purpose for our life. You're still showing us daily grace. We look forward to these studies ahead in the book of Philemon. We trust you will use them to minister to our hearts. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Sneak preview, if you're quick. As we bring our service to a close today, we want to sing a song that reminds us of our relationship to Christ and what a difference he has made in our lives as we sing, All I Have is Christ. Let's stand as we sing together. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would hold a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still but as i ran my hell on rain indifferent to the cost you looked upon my helpless state and led me to your cross and i beheld god's love display you suffered in my place you bore the wrath reserved for me now all i know is grace hallelujah all i have is christ hallelujah jesus is my life now lord i would be yours alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands would never come from me oh father you my ransom lie in any way you choose and let my song forever be my only book is you hallelujah all I have is Christ, hallelujah, Jesus is my life. O oh Lord, I want to live by faith and daily rest in you. For if I trust in my own strength, I will play the fool. So thank you for your finished work. For me on Calvary, your love and grace, now dear to me through all eternity. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Hallelujah. 